And uh, just a little bit about me, uh, Paul Larson. I live in Spanish Fort, Alabama. Wife, two kids, and I'm a multifamily real estate investor. And we bought a lot of real estate together since 2020. So most of what I own was bought with him and I. What's a lot? Well, 700 units together. Man. Yeah. Really, the unit count was so big to us at one time, and it's like the least, we're not even concerned about that anymore. Because it's inevitable that we're going to own thousands and thousands of units. What we work towards now is our lifestyle. Okay. So we won't buy a deal that changes our lifestyle. If it, if it, if we have to work 100 hours a week on it, we won't do it. We don't care if it pays $10 million. We're just not going to do it, right? Because money's not what we work for anymore. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Millionaire in the Megan podcast. My name is Gage. I'm Justin. And we have a very special episode for you guys tonight. But before we get into this episode, I have to ask you guys, have you subscribed to the channel yet? It doesn't sound like they have. Go ahead and subscribe before we get into this episode. But without any further ado, I'm going to kick it to Justin. All right. Today, we got a good, close, personal friend. This man is going to offer so much value with the experience that he has in real estate. I'm going to hand it over to my friend, Paul. And if you could give us a one to three minute, pretty much rundown on who you are. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you guys for having me on the show tonight. And uh, just a little bit about me, uh, Paul Larson. I live in Spanish Fort, Alabama, wife, two kids, and I'm a multifamily real estate investor. And what we do is we buy cash flowing assets as far as apartment buildings, self storage, but we've heavily dived into RV parks lately, as well as a string of Airbnbs. We also lend hard money to investors for flips and other categories, and we're typically GPs in everything we do, uh, but we have, we have moved some money around passively on the LP side as well. Okay. So let's, let's break that down a little bit. What is a GP? Uh, GP is general partner. So we'll talk a little bit about GP and LP. GP is where you're the GP, and you're going to have a certain role specifically in the deal. So for me, my company and my business partner, we take a high percentage of the deal. We find the deal. We manage the deal. We structure the debt. Um, and then we raise capital from passive investors. That will be limited partner. What they do is they put their money into it. It's completely passive. They make great returns and get to keep equity in the deal as well. Okay. That is very helpful. So how did you get started into real estate? Uh, well, uh, I've been like, just tell you a little bit about before I got into real estate, uh, I pretty much worked for corporate America, uh, got out of high school, didn't go to college, well, went to college for a couple of semesters, realized it really wasn't for me. Right. Um, always been, you know, very, um, um, you know, have been in motion, always busy. I cut grass, traded baseball cards, uh, just very active teenager and played sports, played baseball, football growing up. But when I got out of high school, I just didn't really know what I wanted to do. So, uh, I went into construction. A lot of my family were blue collar and, uh, I worked for the union. And by the time I was 21, made foreman kind of ran job sites. And that was right before 2008. And what happened in 2008? Crash came, right? <clears throat> so fast forward quite a bit. I uh, just bought a brand new house, bought a brand new car, and had no money in my bank account. What age is this? Uh, right before 2008. So 2007 going into 2008. How, how old were you at the time? 21. 21, okay. Yeah. So I was 21, had a house, car, all these bills, and no money saved up whatsoever. Had no idea how to save money, how to make money other than going to work and trading time for it, right? So at that moment, it was pretty humbling. I had to move back in with my dad, okay? And he had a small vending machine business. He was an entrepreneur and was like, hey, I can pay you enough to pay your bills, sell your house, move in with me, get back on your feet. We'll figure it out. So had my head, you know, hung my head low, walked in, went to sleep, and just woke up the next day and I said, you know what? I'm not going to work for another company that determines how much money I make. So I instantly went into sales. And so I started working in the insurance business. Uh, worked at AIG, finished my career in the insurance business um, at New York Life. So did retirement accounts, IRAs, life insurance, health insurance, and did really, really well, but I hated it. I did not enjoy it whatsoever. 
Uh, just genuinely love people. Uh, so I think that carried me most of the way was just getting in front of people and just truly wanting to help them. So uh, while all that happened, I met my wife at the time was, um, you know, she was she had this big grandiose plan. And you met my wife. Yeah. More right? bullets on John. Yeah. She I mean, one of the most badass entrepreneurs I know. And, uh, you know, that's something else we'll talk about, too, is about your spouse and, and, and vision moving forward. But, you know, I give a lot of credit to her. Uh, when we met, she didn't tell me at first, but she had this restaurant in mind. So we'd been dating for about eight months. And she said, hey, I have this idea. I said, OK. She said, I own this piece of property that she didn't tell me about until, you know, eight months after we'd been dating. And said, uh, I want to turn this into a restaurant. This is my dream. This is my passion. I said, well, hell yeah. This is awesome. I, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I'd been working for corporate. So I said, look, I'll tell you what, I'll help you do this. I had a little construction background, you know, before all that. And I said, we'll revamp this place. And what we did is we turned it into the first Vons. And okay. um, you fast forward a few years, we developed out three restaurants, um, a food truck, a catering business, and did that for about 10 years. Okay. Along that way, I still worked at corporate America, right? And I'd come in at the end of my shift and I'd go work at nighttime and I would, you know, work with the customers, work with the uh, staff. And I did that seven days a week. Right. Um, so, but while in corporate America, I was at Jag, Land Rover, BMW, Cadillac. Uh, what I did was, uh, I was a finance manager. I went to finance school for that. Um, I was general sales manager and I helped build teams. I helped build cultures. So I enjoyed it because it was at the Highline dealerships and I had really good customers. And the cool thing is, is the whole time I didn't re realize the network I was building there, the customers that I made, the people that I met the people that I met through the restaurant, the people that uh, came into my life over that time were very high level people. I mean, if you're buying a Range Rover, a BMW, you're doing pretty well, right? Uh, and if you're coming to the restaurant, you're spending a lot of money, a lot of attorneys, doctors, and so on and so forth. So uh, all this time we were building this nice network, but also they were becoming our friends and family. And um, my last stint uh, was at Cadillac and I had made an impression on someone and this guy reached out to me and said, hey, I need somebody to build an army at my company. I said, OK, what is it? We wholesale. We do real estate. I said, awesome. I don't know much about it. I said, but, uh, you know, I, I mean, I build sales teams. That's what I do. And I was really good at it. He said, well, look, if you can build the sales teams out, I can teach you the real estate side. So, OK, that sounds like a sounds like a plan. And uh, so you fast forward that story. When I, I started with that company uh, as director of sales, I worked with uh, the COO directly and we built out the acquisitions team and disposition team. It was my job to train these guys how to sit down, negotiate um, wholesale deals, how to go in and buy homes from individuals and also train the, the disposition team, which is these guys work with investors and they raise capital to then buy the deals that we wholesale. A great company, taught me a ton. Um, but again, it was working in corporate America, you know? I mean, grinding 70, 80 hours a week, paycheck was zero to hero every month. You still make a lot of money, but you pay the most taxes. Um, you have to chase the next deal and you're building somebody else's company. There's no perpetuity. <clears throat> There's no perpetuity. And when you have that come out kind of commitment to the company, I mean, you got to draw blood for them. You got to get up and run through the door every day. And I just felt myself not there anymore. While I was there, um, you know, bought uh, quite a bit of real estate. That was part of the deal. If you come on, you can buy real estate. And I jumped on it and uh, bought about 100 units while I was working for them. Now, when you say 100 units, is that RV parks, multifamily, commercial yeah. strip malls? So started buying a bunch of duplexes and quadplexes, probably bought about 50 units in that. I bought a, uh, then I bought a 48 unit <clears throat> mobile home park. And then I bought three uh, beach houses. And that's when I decided to, hey, I've got this thing going and I want to leave on good terms and I want to go build something for my family. So I was thinking long term generational wealth at that point. Hmm. OK, so let me ask you this then here. Push the microphone down just a little bit. There you go. Push the top part down. There you go. 
How many units do you think it takes for somebody to leave their job? Let's say you were making, you know, six figures at your, you know, corporate America job. How many units did it take until you really said, I can leave? A hundred? Fifty? Like, when was the point where you really started getting the inclination that you could start building something that would keep moving forward and keep you safe and your family safe? <clears throat> That's a great question. Um so when I left at that point, um, I was making close to $200,000 a year, okay? okay? And I needed to replace that income. Well, I didn't quite replace that income, but my wife said, listen, we're going to do this. We're going to figure it out. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we took a big gamble on ourselves, and those deals that I bought weren't paying fully. We were rehabbing. We were working on them. We were getting where they need to be. We were carrying debt. That's scary. Yeah, it was, man. Um, but we we asked ourselves, I mean, it, you know, what do we want to, what are we doing this for? We'd been in the restaurant industry for, you know, eight years at that point. We'd been working 20 hour days, um, you know, chasing our tails on the hamster wheel practically. And we knew that there was just more to this. And it really even wasn't the money. You know, it was the time that we wanted to spend with each other, the places we wanted to go with each other. So, yeah, and to answer your question, what does it take for someone to walk away from their company? I think they need to reverse engineer it. I think they need to ask themselves, first of all, um, I didn't do this, but I recommend doing this, is to where do you really want to go? Because I kind of left the company without a 100% game plan. Hmm. I just, hey. You jump ship. Yeah. You know, and at the end of the day, you know, uh, yeah, 100 units sounds like a lot, right? But I bought half of those just a couple of months before I left and we were under construction Yeah, and we needed to fill them. We needed to bring money in. So um, I would say reverse engineer what you have going on and look at your bills. Well, how much is your mortgage, your car notes? Do your kids go to private school? I mean, do you need to put them in public school? <laughs> do you need to cut back on some expenses? We sold a big house on the water, you know, that was beautiful three story and we moved into a house half the size. And, you know, right before we opened our company. So we made some sacrifices to, you know, make some gains and build a company. And I think when you do that, if you can make certain sacrifices, reduce your bills best you can, and then go, okay, I need to make six grand a month or I need to make eight grand a month. And then you need to figure out how many units does it take to make that. And also, can you move a couple of those deals? Because we would move deals around too. So we'd buy one for 300K and sell it for 385 two months later, right? So we'd make a couple of rips here and there. And then sometimes those rips are only 10 grand and sometimes they're 400,000. It just depends on the deals that you have in the pipeline. So there's slow money, fat, medium money, and fast money. Um, we'll do it. We'll do it fast money first, right? Because that's the wholesaling. That's the flip. The, you know, the wholesaling, the crypto, the couple things like that that you're trying to make some quick rips. And then you got the me the medium, right? Which is like you know uh, flipping. It takes time. You got to right. find the deal. You got to put it in there. You got to flip it. Um, hard money. You know, that's medium because you get your money back in several months from the guys. And then you got your slow money, which which is the most important. And one of my mentors taught me that. Um, that's the buy and hold. That is the uh, real estate that's going to build generational wealth for you and your family. So every single month that starts, we look at the first of the month a whole lot different than we used to. We used to look at the first of the month at all the bills we had to pay. Now we're looking at the money that comes in from everybody paying their rent checks. So it's a different feeling when you look at it that way. It's a very good feeling. Mm -hmm. I started doing that at 18 on accident. <laughs> oh, it yeah. changed my life. It was an accident how I hopped into <laughs> you know, getting my first mailbox money, my first little bit of mailbox money, it started feeling good. Now it's just direct deposit money. I don't even have to get checks anymore. But having that financial stability and that cushion where, you know, let's say I didn't have a, a good month with sales, I'm still getting a rent check that comes in every month. I had that long-term vision, delayed gratification. Hey, yeah. what if I just keep stacking my money, keep saving my money, invest everything I can into multifamily because I believe in it. This is about 2015, 2017. Yep. Multifamily was a very good sector to get into around that time. That one little just long-term vision that I had where I was like, look, at 25 years old, I'm going to own 25 units. At 25, I basically just said, I don't have to work again for the rest of my life if I don't mm -hmm. really want to. Now, I'm going to still keep hustling it, but 
having that safety net of rent coming in every month. I don't know how any of my businesses are going to do tomorrow, Mm -hmm. but I do know that I'm going to get a rent check from the first to the fifth every month. I'm going to get 30 plus rent checks coming in or Airbnb deposits. Yep. And, and man, I'll tell you, so just to give you um, a little clarification on that, our first deal was a four unit deal, right? Right. So, I mean, it's this simple, like you can go far in the weeds trying to figure every little detail out, but it's, it's this simple, but we can make it even easier than this. We looked at the deal. It was $176,000. We had no money to really throw at it. We pulled a HELOC out of our house. What's a HELOC? Okay. That's where you pull a little bit of line of equity out of your house. So that way you have cash. It's tax-free. It's a loan. You don't have to pay taxes on it. We used it as a down payment on the first property. So we didn't run around saying we didn't have money. We figured out how to get money. You know? <clears throat> so we did that. And then we had a mortgage on it for like 1200 bucks, right? But every single person in the um, the property was paying $800 a month in rent. So that's what, 3200 bucks a month? And you got a $1,200 a month uh, mortgage payment? We borrowed a little bit of money to fix the house up. So, you know, we were making a couple thousand dollars a month, practically. With OPM. Yeah, I mean, you know, a couple Gs, so you know, there's a couple grand there and a couple grand here. I mean, how, how easy is it to make, um, how simple can it be to make $100,000 of, you know, residual income? It doesn't take as long as you think. 100 properties at $1,000 a month cash flow. You know, I mean, there you go. Let's let's touch on that. At what point after you left your job did you did this stability start to kick in? <clears throat> so 2020, um, so 19 is when I started my company, okay? So I'd been buying real estate for a couple years at that point. Um, that real estate didn't kick in as heavy, but 2019, I'd bought some good real estate. 2020 was even better because COVID actually had some landlords on the fence. And we took, you know, um, our opportunity to get in front of people and, you know, hey, look, this is what we're looking for. This is our buy box. This is, you know, what, you know, how we operate. And we built some confidence in these buyers. So the ones that were on the fence that didn't want to sell were ready because they didn't know what were going to happen. We were willing to take the chance to say, hey, we're good operators, we're going to make this happen. So 2020 was great, but 2021 was my takeoff year. That was, so four years deep is when it really hit. That's, you know, so I made a, I, I, I met my business partner in 2020, and that changed my, my whole life because, you know, I was a mom and pop Southern boy from Mobile, Alabama, just making things happen just off of pure grit, have an amazing wife uh and our dna is just to you know we're, we're dream chasers man we're gonna make it happen we're not gonna concern ourselves with what is the downside because we know that if we're gonna bet on ourselves we're gonna win that was our attitude that's a dan that could be you know a great thing and it can be dangerous too so where when i met my uh, business partner in 2020 that's when things happened Right. So Jeff uh, is he become one of my best friends. We're family now. But we met at a a conference, a real estate conference. And Jeff's background was working for big institutions. They managed, you know, half a billion dollars worth of real estate all across the country. And his job was to get on the phone and make sure these properties were up to date, making sure the P&Ls were tight. He one of the best asset managers you can possibly be to run these projects. So we met, we shared a sandwich, and uh, we really enjoyed our conversation and just started going, you know what, man, we got to keep this going. So I am I was more of the, you know, negotiator, uh, get in front of people, make deals happen. Um, I was good at raising capital. Uh, but when I met him, I learned so much more. And, you know, that be- turned into a partnership that, you know, we had bought a lot of real estate together since 2020. So most of what I own was bought with him and I. What's a lot? Well, 700 units together. Man. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, and and really the unit count was so big to us at one time. And it's like the least we're not even concerned about that anymore because now it's inevitable that we're going to own thousands and thousands of units. What we work towards now is our lifestyle. OK, so we won't buy a deal that changes our lifestyle if it. If, it, if we have to work 100 hours a week on it, we won't do it. We don't care if it pays $10 million. We're just not going to do it, right? Because money's not what we work for anymore. It was at one time. 
you know, and I think that's what we all think we're working for. And that's what we need to have that comfort level to be able to breathe and be able to travel and be able to buy things and and do things and help others. And uh, for me, it's coaching my kids in baseball. You know, it's to be able to, you know, have, you know, lunch with my wife today before I came here. Right. All right. Let's go have some lunch and spend some time together. Um, you know, we, we pick our kids up from school. We take them. We're, we're big family people. So it's important to us to be at every single, uh, game, um, event, dinner at night, breakfast in the morning. You know, it's pretty much living life by design. So, uh, when I met Jeff, I mean, that was his philosophy, living life by design. And I feel like I've always been pretty good at looking at uber successful people and going, that's the person I need to listen to. You know, I've always had enough humility to go, I'm, I want to be the least intelligent guy here. I want to be the least financially strong, right? I don't like to say the dumbest guy in the room, right? Nobody wants to be the dumbest guy, but it's okay if you are trying to constantly better yourself and grow. Um, I look at it as uh, building a muscle, right? It's small at first, but you get in the gym. I mean, you know this, you get in the gym, you work out, you take your, your protein, you eat good food. And eventually, you know, months and months and years down the road, your body changes and transforms and it becomes second nature. And that's how, you know, business and living life by design is. You can make a decision like that based off of, am I going to buy this deal or do I not want to buy this deal? Right. And then you reduce anxiety you reduce all this. Let me analyze 150,000 deals. You know exactly what you're looking for. I want 100 units at a time. I want it to be in these locations. I want it to be um, at this number. I want it to have this amenities. If it doesn't fit the buy box, we don't even look at it. And we don't worry about if we miss the deal or not. We don't care. We know that we're going to constantly acquire properties based off of what we're looking for. If you had to hit the reset button, would you abide by those same rules right now? Hundred percent. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I, I think. Um, um, you mean as far as? Yeah, let, let's say this way. Do you do you think the strategy you use to buy twenty units is the same you're using to buy a hundred? Oh, the same absolutely. you used to buy five hundred units later absolutely down the road? Not. No. Mm-mm. That, that that changes. That changes tremendously. Okay. Um, you know, because when I first started buying units, I, I honestly I didn't know what I was buying. I just looked at it like, hey, this is the mortgage. This is how much I need to put into it. This is what I can rent it for. All right, I'm making some money, right? I didn't look at the tax strategy. I didn't look at the appreciation. I didn't look at any of that. I was cash flow guy, hardcore, and I'm still heavy cash flow guy, right? If it doesn't cash flow day one, other than than a development. And we are we just added development on at our company um, this past year. So we got two developments right now w- that we're working on. And I mean that's that's just the long term game. I mean you you know it's going to take time. You got to get the zoning. You got to break ground, and then you know two three years later you start making money. So I gotcha. I like to touch on the time part. It seems like a very interesting thing. It's always interesting for me to hear successful people talk about time. How many hours a week are you putting in? Are you analyzing all these deals yourself? You have a team. Do you mind talking about that operation? Absolutely. So coming from working 80 to 100 hours a week, I mean, I always like, you know, was proud of that. I thought I'm the hardest working man in the room. And then I started meeting people that were a lot smarter than me. And I would I would sit down at these tables like this. Right. And we would talk about who we are, what our business is, you know, what kind of bottlenecks do we have? And I would say, this is what I do. This is where I'm at, so on and so forth. And I go, man, you got to get some help. He's like, I remember when I was you, right? And I wore all those hats. You can only do so much. And I'll tell you, God's gift you with being great in a couple of areas. But you're going to be average in a lot. And I found that the things that I'm really, really good at, if I spend all of my time on that, then I separate myself from the pack and I add true value to whoever I'm working with and into the marketplace. Right. So stick to what you're great at. And then it feels like you're just living the dream life because that stuff's easy. It's what you're great at. So when you're really great at something, you want to do it over and over and over again. It's the things to me like, am I good at spreadsheets? Yeah. My business partner, mad scientist. 
I mean, he can analyze a deal, put it in a spreadsheet, get everything to the lender and boom, have it done in 30 minutes. And I'm going to procrastinate for a week before I do all that because I don't want to do it. I don't like to do it. But what I do well is I negotiate the deals and I raise a lot of capital from investors. I love to get on the phone with my investors and go, hey, I got some quarterly checks coming. And guess what? We got some new deals. I'm going to let you have first look at this thing. All right. Tell me about it. Absolutely. And I'll geek out and I'll talk about it for as long as they want to talk about it. Um, so there's a team 100 percent involved. So I handle a lot of the negotiations. I have callers. It's like this. I have callers that call on properties. Once they call on the properties, I have the first caller that warms them up. Second caller goes out. If there's meat on the bone, that's when I come in. That's when I sit down and go, okay, we're going to buy the deal. Once that happens, I pass it off to Jeff. Jeff then has his team um, analyze the deal. He'll analyze it. He'll do a lot of things, but he'll have his team pull the rent comps and all that. So we team, we tag team this deal. So I have a couple people. He'll have a couple people, and it's about five of us working at all times. Mm. You know what I mean? So it like we can look at 150 deals a month, and I honestly hadn't looked at any of them. So by the time I, there's a deal, now I can jump on what I'm good at, and then I can you know turn that switch on, pull that lever, and then we can start getting this thing to the close. That saves a lot of brain power. <clears throat> yep. That's something I've been running into lately. I mean, I've been putting in 40, 60 hours a week into social media alone, my mm -hmm. gym, my Airbnbs my remodels, it right. becomes almost a little overwhelming trying to run five, six, seven companies at one time. And mm -hmm. I've recently just been doubled down on hiring more people to take on the workload. I would take my stress level, cut it in half by hiring an employee, increasing their stress level, cuts mine in half. And then I'm just like, okay, dope. Now I can increase my stress level again. I find another employee and just keep repeating, repeating this process over and over again. Are you having good luck with virtual assistants or in-house assistants? Um, I prefer in-house for what I do. I'll tell you why. We have VAs. I mean, we have <clears throat> about five. Okay. Um, but the the thing that why I love in-house people for what I do is because you have very you have much more savvy uh, owners that own multi million dollar projects, right? So when you're wholesaling or you're flipping a house, um, a VA can call. If somebody's in trouble, they want to get out of their house. They don't care if you can speak good English. They don't care who you are. It can be a, you know, a long distance number. They're just like, save me, get me out of this. Let's do a deal. When you call on uh, RV parks, multifamily uh, storage units, I mean, like I said, multi-million dollar projects, uh, a lot of times you don't get to the owner. And when you do get to the owner, once you, once you have to get through the management team, once you do get to the owner, um, they're a lot more savvy. If they hear any broken English, if they, hear, if they think it's from out of town, they think it's a scam and they won't get on the phone. So we have better luck paying, we pay people 25 bucks an hour for right. calls. When your average VA is about four or five bucks an hour. Right. But you get what you pay for. <clears throat> exactly. So for, for my business model, it works. And I'll say this, my business model is not for everybody. And there's no right or wrong way to do it. If you have a certain business model, if you have a certain asset class, then you're going to have to uh, be malleable, right, to what works for that asset and what works for, for you. And as long as it works for you and you're getting results, because results is all I care about. And anybody that works for me, I don't, I mean, I don't want them to work eight, 10 hour days. I mean, if they can get done in 10 hours in a two hour work day, numbers don't lie. That's what we look at. Numbers. Results. Results, man. You know, we, we enjoy our lifestyle. We want our people that work with us to enjoy theirs just as much. So typically if somebody comes to do business with us or work with us, they're super high level people. Would you agree that hard work really doesn't matter in real estate? It's just creativity and efficiency? Creativity is number one. Um, you know, just just having the, the – I mean, I always thought that, you know, anybody could be an entrepreneur. I did <clears throat> up until not too long ago, right? Because I felt like I, that, you know, if I've been able to make it to where I'm at, and then not to compare yourself to others because, you know, I say what I have. And then next, I know guys that own thousands of units. You buy a small jet and then you got the big Lear pulling up next to you, right? And then, you know, so you got to be excited and happy about where you are because of what you've worked to get to, right? But, um, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, it just, you know, it just depends on, you know, who, where the direction you're trying to go and what your vision is. You know what I mean? And once you understand exactly what your vision is and what you're trying to accomplish, 
And then at that point, uh, you're pretty confident in the people that you bring on. And the people that we bring on, um, you know, resonates with our culture and who we are, right? Um, we, I think that when you think about efficiency and creativity, those are, you know, high category. But you got to be somebody that's willing to, you know, get kicked in the gut twice before breakfast and still be able to go after it, you know? And that's the DNA that you have to have. So... Um, if you don't have that, it's hard to be an entrepreneur, you know, and that's why corporate America doesn't have the culture that, you know, we like to build, um, you know, corporate America is practically your number and you're, you have a number to hit and that number is not good enough next quarter. And also, you know, I'm 37 years old. You're 22, 22, right? If you, if they can pay you less money or, and, and you could come in and do it cause you're hungry, they're going to replace me. Yeah. I, I was the man for 10 years. Well, that doesn't matter anymore because they got young, young guy right here, uh, handsome, ready to go, hungry, you know, will take potentially less money than somebody that's been there for a 10 year. So when I bring somebody on, I look for somebody that's really freaking good at what they're coming to do for me. I, I don't want to train anybody. I want somebody to have something they're really good at. And then I want to plug them into what I'm doing. And a good example of that is I have a good friend that I just brought in as a partner on this deal we're closing tomorrow. And so I did a lot of the project management for the past several years, right? Dealing with the contractors, um, getting everything lined up, doing the scope of work, taking the bids, getting the uh, timelines together and all that, right? And so guess what? I brought him on after we built a, a nice... Um, uh, relationship and there was trust there and then there was a two-year relationship and I brought him in to be a partner not pay him a fee not you know hey man this is a one-off no you're getting equity in this deal and you're going to be the project manager because guess what you're better at it than I am so I alleviate myself from the project management side on this next deal he has an opportunity to then become a partner make really good money start building equity and generational wealth for his family because we are equity guys, right? We're not fee driven guys. When we raise capital, we do deals. We're not worried about hitting everybody with a property management fee, a, um, a sponsorship fee, a disposition fee and asset man, all this stuff, right? We charge an acquisition fee, keeps the lights on. It takes care of flights and due diligence and stuff like that. It's pretty minimal. Um, we're long-term generational wealth guys. So we look for equity. We look for cash flow. And anybody that is in my circle, that's what we want them to. We want them to have that same vision. We don't want to make you have that vision. You need to have that vision. We can help amplify it. We can open up some, you know, Pandora's box and go down why it's so important. But at the end of the day, um, you know, we're equity guys. And when you think about it that way, you don't worry about where that next deal is coming from. You don't worry about how much money you're going to make because, again, you have your buy box. You know how much money you're going to make. You know the deal you're looking for. You know the partners you're looking for. And you know where the, the end goal is. So it's just get up and keep doing the same thing you do every day. And it's crazy hearing this right now because I'm doing the exact same thing at this, I guess, po portion of my life. I'm just trying to surround myself with people that see that long-term vision. You know, the ship's going to sail soon, and if – you don't hop on board six, seven, eight months down the road when we're off sailing, we're not going to turn the boat around for you. Man, that really hits home right there. I mean, I guess you can validate that. Everyone I surround myself with, I want you here in five years. I want you here in 10 years. I want you here in 30 years. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to see your grandchildren eat one day. And I can't think of a better way to do that than with real estate right now. Uh, generational wealth. I can put properties in a trust that my great grandchildren can't ever sell one day. Yeah. There's so much value that you can pass down from father to son to their sons to mm -hmm. their sons that I don't know of many other industries that you can do that with. Can't pass down a job. It's very hard to pass down a job. I don't <laughs> know how you're going to do that. Can't pass down a job. No, but I can give every one of my kids later down the road a portion of each one of my properties. Man, I'll tell you something, just to, <clears throat> not to get too far off topic, but... You know, we're on this passing it down. That was always my thing. You know, I like I want to leave a legacy. I want to leave a legacy for my family. I want my kids to, you know, <clears throat> but man, the more I talk with, um, you know, uh, driven entrepreneurs that are way ahead of me in life. And that's what I love about masterminds. 
you know, if you haven't been in a mastermind or join one, man, you got to find something that fits for you because that's the shortcuts in life and in business, you know, but you know, it's, it, it's the children. When I go to these masterminds now, I ask, you know, Hey guys, what advice do you have on helping your kids understand what it takes or, you know, um, and, and that's being humility, you know, having humility, asking for help, you know, because I don't want people to think that, hey, I got it all figured out. Look, I'm going to this room to help understand how I can be better. But how can I get my kids involved with that? Right. How can I help them? Like my daughter wants to go to work and I'm like, man, you know, the first thing I think is, dang, I don't want her to get a paycheck. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want her to get a paycheck because I don't want her to think like an employee. Um, you know, so, so I ask, Hey guys, what do I need to do? And, and, you know, and then I got some pretty cool advice on, you know, well, this is what I did for my daughter and this is what I did for my son. So, you know, um, that's the one thing that I can say that, that really helps me out, but passing it down to your kids. The truth is, is, you know, some of the kids just aren't gonna, you know, fit that mold, man, as bad as we want them to. I mean, they may or may not. Uh, You can do your best. You can take them to closings. You can take them to the jobs. You can help them read books. Again, um, you know, they got to have it inside of them. So, you know, that's what we hope that we do. And we build that for our kids. And they're able to step up and, you know, take you can hand the torch over to them and start them out small and and build them up. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it's it's these little things that we try to do with the kids at a small age to kind of help balance that to see kind of where it goes. So were you Planting always seeds. were you always thinking like that or was it not until after you had kids where that switch kind of flipped and you're like, oh, I need to start? Yeah. Oh, 100 percent. So you were thinking about that beforehand? No, no. The kids. Yeah. It's, it, you know, and, and, and really, man, you know, I mean, I come from a, a, a very blue collar family, you know, like my dad started a business later in life. Um, you know, so I think he still had it in him and I knew I had it in me cause I was very active, always talked to people, always, uh, you know, would, would figure out how to make money cause my parents just didn't have a lot. And I mean, I literally would go around with a lawnmower and knock on doors that had tall grass. I mean, like simple things that I thought was made sense. Well, his grass is tall. I can cut his grass, work a deal and let's make a little bit of cash. So, but I, I just didn't have the parents guiding me. Because my parents made very little money. They couldn't teach me about money, you know. Um, So that's what I try to do. I try to go, okay, if if I could go back when I was a kid, what would I want my parents to teach me? And that's what I try to do with my kids now. I got you. Let's uh, just real quick. I'm just curious about this. Let's go back to when you were a kid real quick and talk on what what flipped the switch if you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Because you said there was one day you were just like, you know what, I'm done working for money. Oh, now that was, um, that's when I got laid off from the company okay. in, in 08, um, right before 08. And remember, I just bought my house, car, I was 21, and I didn't have any money in the bank either. I didn't know, I had no financial literacy uh, at all. So the, the all these things can be learned and be taught. That's the beautiful thing behind it. But the one thing that can't be taught is you got to have that burning desire to want more, to want to be more, to be better, um, and not want to fit the mold, not want to, you know, do what your parents did because that's the easy way, right? I mean, that's what I started doing. Thank God I got laid off, right? Because what would have happened then? You know, I don't know. Um, I'd like to think that I would have transitioned, but I mean, who knows? So that kind of lit the fire when I lost my job and had no money saved and had to move back in with my dad and uh, sell my house and sell my car and buy a crappy car, you know, and start from scratch. I mean, I had, I mean, what do you call that? Um, Turning point. Yeah. Rock bottom. It's crazy (laughs) how you're most thankful for what at the time was probably your worst moment in life. Yeah, man. You were probably not okay mentally, but looking back at it now, you're so thankful that it happened. I was, it was pretty bad. I mean, you know, to move back in with your with your parents, I was the kid that moved out immediately, Mm -hmm. got an apartment at 18 years old, you know. So to come back home, that was pretty. But thank goodness I had a loving dad um, that was like, hey, come home. I'll I'll put you to work. I can't pay you much money, but uh, we'll make sure your bills are paid. Um, And and, you know, so that was uh, that was pretty cool, too, because when I worked for him, Uh, That was before I got into the insurance business, which working with him really helped me, too, because, um, 
I went door to door. I mean, we had hospitals, we had DHRs, we had the mall, we had all types of things. We'd go and knock on doors and say, hey, are you happy with your service? Um, who, who is your provider? Do these guys take care of you? So on and so forth. So we got some good door to door sales going on. I got you. I love staying in this age range because that's the majority of our audience. Did you like seek out a mentor at that time or were you just self-navigating? Man, I wish I would have. I wish I would have. I didn't even think that far ahead. <clears throat> so, and, and this is another, um, this is another uh, funny thing because I can remember working for my dad and he normally would get, you know, product for his vending machines from Birmingham, Alabama. And for some reason they couldn't get to us. We, we were having some good sales and we ran out of stock. So we went to Sam's and they were cooking hot dogs outside and uh, they were raising money for St. Jude. And my uh, youngest brother, you know, had cancer when he was two and a half years old. So he'd spent his childhood in St. Jude. So it was, you know, a pretty big deal in our uh, growing up. And uh, so I always had a big place in my heart. And I and I walked up to these guys and I said, you know what? I just want to let you guys know that y'all are doing some amazing things. You don't know how many people really appreciate you out here in this heat cooking, you know, hot dogs and then giving 100 percent of your your money to them. And he said, man, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, currently I work for my dad. I lost my job in the downturn. And uh, he said, look, would you come sit in in one of my meetings? And this was like the GM of uh, AIG. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. So, so I said, sure, that, that sounds good. And I can remember walking back to the van going, man, I'm going to make an impression on this guy. And man, I went out and bought, um, you know, I, I just bought some nice clothes because I'd always wore blue collar stuff, you know, and I was like, you know, I'm going to dress nice and, you know, I'm going to look the part for the sales job because my first impression of sales was suit and tie. And I came... I came up there head to toe clean, man, and uh, sat in a meeting and everybody was going. It was Monday morning meeting, too. And they were talking about the money they were making. And remember, I was 21 and I was getting a 40 hour check. Right. I didn't see big money. And um, I think it was about 40 grand a year I was making at that time at that point. And it felt like a whole lot more than that. But uh, they started talking about the checks they made and this person in first place, that person in second place and third place in sales. And, you know, hey, we helped this person. And, you know, this is one of my 40 year customers. And I was like, oh, like all everything I'm hearing, I'm loving. So uh, I said, I got to come work for you. He said, well, you got about 10 other candidates right now. College graduates, um, you know, Ivy League, you know, you're, you're up against all these guys. And they interviewed every one of us and I beat every one of them out. I love that. I always, me and Justin were talking about that the other day. I love like theorizing on whether like, well, let me ask you, let me totally shift the question. If you had a college graduate, you know, whatever degree and somebody else and they came to work for you, would you give them a fair chance? Like the one who doesn't have the degree, would you look at him the same way as the person with a college degree? I have a different opinion now than I did when I didn't have a college degree, right? Because when I didn't have a college degree, it was even harder, to get a job. It's not as hard now because if you can drive revenue, if you're a salesperson, you're going to get hired. If you're good and you can close deals, you're getting hired. And uh, I mean, at the end of the day, you got to drive revenue. A college degree is not going to drive revenue. Um, sometimes, and, and I'm not saying a college degree is not not that's a great thing. I mean, if you're going to be a doctor, an engineer, I can't tell you how many college graduate wits work for me. Uh, that had all these degrees and I didn't have one and I managed them, right? Um, so I say if you can drive revenue, if you're a salesperson, you're going to get hired over anybody. Marketing is going to be right behind it, but marketing better be taken care of for sales to happen. So, um, you know, if you're a salesperson, you know, without a degree or with a degree, if you have a degree and you're a salesperson, then, you know, maybe you get looked at first. But I think now it's more of a an emotional I, uh, IQ is what people are looking for now. Right. How do they fare an interview? Um, how do they carry themselves? Do they look at you? And, you know, it's all the old school things that your dad taught you. Right. Shake a hand when you look somebody in their eyes, shake their hand, say, call them by their name. Yes, sir. No, sir. Um, these little things that were taught um, carry still today. Um, how many people do you know? And I'm a millennial, by the way. Um, 
as hard as that is to say, because, you know, there's a lot of millennials that are, uh, that, that just want things, but there's a lot of people that were my age that just want things, right? And people above me. So I don't think it has anything to do with generations, whether it's baby boomers, because they were lazy too, if they wanted to be. And if millennials wanted to be lazy, they can be right. If you have the tenacity to go after what you want in life, if you want more out of life, if you're going to push for it and prove yourself to somebody, I promise you they're going to give you a chance. I'm going to bet on you. If you come busting through my door and you demand time over and over again to meet with me and you prove it yourself and you show me how you can close deals, I'm going to give you a shot. I love that. So simple question. Would you advocate for your kids to get college degrees? So, uh, Avery will get a college degree. She's just so intelligent. Um, she wants to be a computer engineer. She's been, she's wanted to do that for years. Um, you know, she's a sophomore, so she's in the IB program. She's perfect for it. Uh, Parker. Now he's a spitting image of me, man. I mean, he, you know, I see Parker, you know, I take him to every closing. I take him to all the job sites. He absolutely loves being a part of it. Um, I'm going to say he doesn't need a college degree uh, unless he's going to transit. If he wants to be, like I said, a doctor, engineer, architect, um, you know, I mean, any, any that you can transition right in. But I, Parker's an entrepreneur, I believe. Um, I think he's going to, you know, whether it's come on with me and help build this company or it goes and does his own thing. I, I mean, yeah, he's not going to need a college degree. OK, interesting. So. You mentioned earlier that you can like kind of tell if somebody's got it or not. Like some people are meant to be entrepreneurs. Some people are meant to yeah. go into corporate America. A lot of our younger viewers always ask the question of whether they should go to college or not. And I think the correct answer to that question would be, do you have it or not? How would you know if you had it? Like if you're looking back at your 18 year old stuff, you're like, you know what? I got it as an entrepreneur. I can make it. What would you, what signs would you see? How would you know? Yeah. <clears throat> Again. So my, my biggest, I would say if I'm looking to see if somebody has it, I'm going to say, what is their level of tenacity? How easily do they give up? For instance, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> so I'm talking to a young investor and I have several investors that call me and I love when they do because I want to help young hustlers, man. I want to help them as much as I can. But I had a couple of them come to me and, hey, man, I can't get a refinance. I can't get a refinance. What should I do? I'm like, how many banks you talk to? And I talked to two. And I was like, well, I mean, you know, to be honest with you, do you know how many we talk to? And Jeff and I have been doing deals, multi, multi millions of dollars worth of deals. We talked to 50 banks to get this last deal. Jeez. 50. Now, do you have a lender that reaches out to those banks for you or you are personally We calling? personally talk to them. Oh, man, I've been there before. We, we yeah. personally talked to them. We had a, uh, you know, um, a big, it was just a big project. You know, and um, banks have tightened up. Things have changed. Right. And and we're we're bankable as anybody else in the business. And we've tapped out a lot of banks, banks that only lend five to seven million dollars. We've tapped them out. Right. So that's one thing I'd say. Build relationships with big banks, but they have the small bank feel because because you can tap out five million dollar banks pretty quick in multifamily. And so it, there's legal lending limits. So if you're, you know, have enough liquidity and you're bankable, then whatever that legal limit is for the best client at the bank is what that limit is. So a lot of these smaller banks are five to ten million dollars, but the bank sitting right next to them could be 50 million. Right. So you got to build a relationship with these banks um, to be bankable. But anyway, so I, the, the investor goes, hey, I talked to two lenders. I'm like, man. Even where we're at, we had to talk to 50, 50. You got to be kidding me. I'm like, no, dude, we don't think twice about it. That's when I know if somebody has it, like they don't second guess themselves. Whatever it takes. Yeah. They, they, you can't second guess yourself. And if you do second guess yourself, you got to wake up the next day with a better attitude and go, okay, I got to call 10 banks each day or 20 banks each day. I'm not taking a note. Somebody's going to do a deal with me. Man, the, the, there was a lender sitting across from me at my desk last week, and they go, man, if, you had, uh, if, you, if you've had a challenge uh, here recently with the markets, why don't you switch up from RV parks to a different asset class? I said, because 
you know, this is what we're experts in. We love RV parks. And because if you don't lend the money to us, I'm getting somebody to lend the money to me. It doesn't matter. So what will happen is, is you'll miss out on the next $100 million of transactions because you're not moving with us. And this other bank will. And the very next day, we got the $5 million loan. And boom. I mean, we we had to put a lot of uh, – because that was one of our biggest purchases. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, and I tell banks flat out, listen, we're partnerships, man. Like, you need what I have and I need what you, you have. So let's work a deal together. And banks can appreciate that. But you got to look at it from a credit analyst standpoint when you want to get a deal done. Because even though you're a great entrepreneur, like we love being entrepreneurs, we're nitty gritty, we get in the mud and make it happen. But the banks are very conservative. They don't care how much of a, but they need to know that you're a good operator. They need to know you know how to analyze the deal. So I tell people to look at a bank, like look at a deal like the bank will. So that way, when you send it to the bank, you can get it approved. The underwriter is your best friend. Yeah. They'll save you from bad deals too. Yeah, absolutely. So RV parks are funny, man. It spits out more cash flow than anything we own. But banks are not up on RV parks like they are a multifamily, like say other multifamily, like storage units, uh, apartment buildings. So I've told several lenders, and we haven't had a hard a, a problem getting loans on them, but there's a lot of lenders that second guess lending. The only reason they look at us is because we have strong uh, financials. You know, right. if we didn't have strong financials, they wouldn't even look at it. They don't even have it in their portfolios. There's a lot of moving parts in RV parks, and it's a lot easier to make mistakes in RV parks. It's probably a lot easier to mismanage those than an apartment complex. That, yeah, so that's that's where they look at it. But our business model is totally different than most people's business models. There's plenty of guys doing it like us, but we do more long term stays. So we flip it and go instead of have, we have hundred pad park instead of having a hundred moving pieces, we go we're going to have eighty percent long term. So that cash flow is consistent. Those people mm. stay there. Smart. Right? And then we put good park rules in place, good management in place, run a tight ship, leave the other 20% for icing on the cake to get transient, you know, fast money. So, you know, we actually have turned a more transient, uh, more moving piece, more moving piece uh, property to a more stable um, long-term play. And it's worked well for us. And now banks are starting to understand. But if you look back 15 years at self-storage, that's the same thing you have now with RV parks. People are sleeping on them. And eventually that's when people are going to catch on, right? And we've been just going to town on them for the past two and a half years. What percentage of your portfolio is RVs? <laughs> oh, man, 75% now. I've sold some stuff off just to buy more. Dang. Yeah, <clears throat> I love it. I mean, there's, there's nothing that... Um, compares to it on cash flow. Nothing. What do you think your average NOI is? What do you think your average income is per RV park? Oh, man. Do you shoot for 12%, uh, 8%? Well, I'll tell you this. Um, we shoot for 25% returns for our investors. And okay. we keep 80% of the deal. Right. So if That's they your make, IRR, though. It, but what yeah. about, what, what do you think your average net operating uh, income is? I, let, me, let me rephrase that. If you chopped all your pieces up, divided them equally, do you think you're operating at 8%, 12%, 10% across the board? And that's not factoring in debt, like your cap rate, I guess. Yeah. So uh, are you asking about cap rate or are you asking what we're making on a net return? I guess the same thing. Let's cap rate, let's make it easy. So cap rate, I mean, so we're buying, so this is what we look for. We, we buy a lot of deals at double digit cap rates already. Right. Right. So we may buy it at a, you know, 12 to 14 percent cap rate and take it into the 20s. What are some strategies that you use to value add that? All right. And and I'll tell you this real quick. So if we find deals in the 12 to 14 percent, but we can take them into the 20s, which sounds crazy, right? We take them from a 12 to 14 percent to the 20s. I'm going to tell you how we do it. One thing is, is we everything we buy has high vacancy. So we're capitalizing on mom and pop RV parks. Simply filling the park up makes it worth so much more money, right? A lot of times these owners are um, way under rents. They haven't moved rents in 10 plus years, right? So we'll go to a park that they're getting $250 a month in rent when it should be 800 Right. 
650, 750. So we'll go in, we will completely revamp. We will put a new website in, we'll, we'll rebrand. We will get rid of bad folks. We will add amenities if we want to add a pool or clean up the pool, with clubhouse. Um, we'll put in new roads if need be, plumbing, electrical. And sometimes we don't have to do any of that. Sometimes it's very minimal. Um, and at that point, we start plugging our management in place, and then we start filling the parks. And that's usually about a good 12 to 15-month play right. from time we close on the deal to the time we're fully stabilized, ready for refinance. They're probably about 50% occupied, and when you get a hold of it, it's 75 80%, right? Maybe Exa- more. Exactly. Well, you're lo- you're more long-term. You should be 80 90-plus so, percent. Well, we just did a refinance two months ago, and we were over 90%. That's amazing. So, And, and, and think about this. I mean, if... if If we can take that property and keep it in the mid-teen cap rate and we can sell it or refi it at 7.5% in Alabama right now. Right. So the gap there is ridiculous. If you just take it from a 50% occupancy to a 75, that's an extra 25% you just made right there. Exactly, exactly. I I tell people that with a commercial, like say you get a commercial tenant, they're paying $2,000 a month. Just going up on their rent by five hundred dollars, you just increase the value of that property tremendously. Yeah. So um, a small deal we did, uh, we bought last year. I'll just tell you, uh, uh, everybody likes numbers. Numbers yes. are fun to talk about. So we uh, we bought this deal as one hundred twenty five units um, here in Alabama, um, and Bay Manette, You know where Bay Manette is? I mean, <clears throat> on the water, uh, one hundred twenty five pads. It's got. 500 yards of waterfront and it has 25 boathouses and we don't own the boathouses they rent slots slips from us so we bought it for 1.53 million and we refied it at 3.6 million 17 months later right and so we capitalized on low rents they were at 150 dollars a month we've got them to 400 net because we charge 500 and they get 100 dollars a month in utilities Okay, so we know we net 400 bucks per tenant. We took it from uh, being about 45 percent occupied to over 90 percent occupied. Went in and cleaned the property out, took out trees, redid some roads. Um, We added an office at the front. We put in all brand new um, electrical. We put nice um, um, mailboxes across for everybody because it's more long term. Right. And then um, we bumped every, you know, we bumped everybody's rent that came in from probably the last four or five months to five hundred bucks. So we've even we've even been able to gain another hundred dollars between the four hundred, going from one hundred and fifty to two hundred bucks. So practically, if you add that up, you know, let's say you do an average of three hundred dollars a month bump, right, across one hundred twenty five units. That's how much you add to that property. So that's probably forty grand, with roughly. With a stroke of a pen, pretty much. Yeah, forty well, grand, forty grand a month, forty thousand a month added to the bottom line on on one deal. So, you know, and then we go and we'll refi it and we'll get our capital out of it and quite a bit more tax free and move on to the next deal. A lot of people are scared to raise rents. I've never had a problem with it. No tenant has ever argued with me. Just about <laughs> then the, the the few that do. I mean, what are you going to do, honestly? You're a good landlord. I don't gouge. I don't gouge them, but it's like, look, my property taxes went up. My insurance yep. went up almost double yep. this year. You're paying an extra three hundred dollars a month, or you know, it's just not going to work. You're a good landlord, though. You you know, you take care of the property. You yep. give them a, a safe place to live. People will pay more, man. Um, they want to they yep. want to be in a good school zone. If they have kids, they want to be close to shopping. They want to be close to the interstate if possible. They want to live in. They prefer Baldwin County, you know. It, or some people prefer Mobile. Mobile. It just depends. We have rentals on both sides. Uh, but when you take care of it and you spruce it up and you keep it clean and you do uh, maintenance on it, um, you get top dollar. What pro- what percentage do you buy your RV parks at as far as equity goes? Like, let's say, do you shoot for 75% market value, 80% market value? I mean, idealistically, idealistically as low as possible. Let's say. So we, we you know. I, I have a buy box, man. I okay. Mean, can you uh, know exactly. describe your buy box for our listeners? If somebody's got a deal for Paul. How do they approach you and yeah. say, just don't even waste his time sliding in his DMs with anything less than this? <laughs> so, um, man, we, we're we at like 100 units or more is, okay. is kind of our buy box. But if it's in my backyard, I'll do 50. 
I'll do 50 units. So my backyard is, you know, anywhere here in Alabama. I'm in Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, and I'm closing on a deal in Louisiana next month. So we're in four states. Anywhere outside of where I'm at, maybe four or five hours um, of any of those, it's going to have to be 100 pads or more. It's easier to plug ma- um, our management in. It's easier to, you know, there's more juice in the squeeze. There, the, you know, Most of the parts we're going to buy are going to have, um, you know, a lot of room to bump rents, a lot of room to bring people in. So we can partner up and do deals that way. But uh, like I'm closing on a 50 unit tomorrow and, you know, it's in the backyard. It's 30 minutes away from one of our parks. So we're going to cross manage that park with the same park manager. So, you know, that makes it easy. So I'd say 50 units or more. Um, I would say city water, city sewer is a plus. I would say... Um, and, and then we're going to analyze the deal. To answer your question... We like to buy 50, 60 cents on the dollar. So, as would anybody else? Yeah. Mm, Well, I mean, just like, yeah, I mean, just like the deal, like we bought for 1.5 and we had it appraised for 3.6. So, that's kind of what we like to do. So, we look at it if we can make a deal worth 5 million, we're going to look at 60% of that. Let's just say 50% just to keep math easy. We'll say 2.5 million. And then we're going to take out all the carrying costs, all the construction, any rehab, um, so on and so forth. And then we're going to make an offer. Right. And you can still get deals that way. Yes. And we're getting it in RV parks and a lot of people don't understand them. They don't know how to analyze them. They don't know how to make an offer on them. So we're still able to buy. A lot of apartment guys are having a hard time, you know, or at least was having a hard time. Uh, once market took off, everybody started buying apartment complexes and cap rates went super low. Uh, a lot of people and, you know, insurance was one of the insurance, large insurance companies bought up a ton of multifamily just to, you know, they were buying it under what the interest rates were yeah. just to break even on inflation. Pretty yeah. much everyone just started dumping money into multifamily. I tell people it's not the same market that would. When I jumped into it, 2015, 2017, you could find multifamily. You know, people were just selling them left and right. They didn't know what mm-hmm. they had. Nowadays, though, man, I don't know how you could even buy. I mean, interest rates are what six, seven percent now commercially. Yeah. It depends Minimum. on who you are, man. You know, man, I mean, hard. sometimes you can get hit harder. I mean, we got a we got a deal um, that we're so the one we're closing on tomorrow is right at six percent. And the Louisiana deal is going to be 5.75, still on this market. Mm. So I got a partner over there that has a great relationship. You know, guy's been doing a lot of business um, for a decade. Without so a value like, add, you're pretty much not even breaking even almost. What's that? At 5 to 6% cap rate? No, oh, no. Okay, 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 okay. 5%, okay. 5%, 5 or 6% interest rate. Okay. Yeah, buying the deal. Okay, so, I think that the cap rate was fine. I was about to say, man, no, you're like breaking even. No, almost. no, okay. no. That that's no. Like I told you, we're buying twelve to fourteen okay. percent caps. Like yeah, okay. in, okay. like in buy, right? And then we're taking them into the twenties, and then we're bringing them back and refining them below, you know, seven to eight percent. You're pulling out your equity. Oh yeah, and a whole lot more. Do you regret selling any of your earlier properties? No, I don't. Mm-mm. Okay. Mm-mm. Do you I wish saw- you still held on to them? Mm-mm. I don't. Okay. That's let's, interesting. Let's touch on regrets because a lot of people online in general just don't touch on the bad things that happen. Do you mind being transparent and yeah. speaking about some of the yeah. downfalls on your yeah. journey? Yep. Yeah. So I'll touch on that. But to let you know why I don't regret <clears throat> is because I was able to sell some beach houses. I was able to sell some small multifamily. And what I did was I just 1031 and got went into bigger deals. And I was buying them right. You know, and also I sold some, paid some capital gains to be more bankable as I sign on bigger loans. Because if you don't have money in the bank and you're trying to sign on a multi-million dollar project, bank's not going to do it. You know, so there's got to be a little, little give, a little uh, back and forth. So I hate to have money in the bank. I do. But if you're going to sign on a big loan, they got to understand, hey, does this guy have liquidity? What is his global cash flow? How much is he bringing in? So there's a balancing act as you start signing on bigger projects. And that's another way that you can get somebody to do a deal with you. So like, let's say if somebody can't uh, sign on a loan, but they found a deal, you could bring me in or somebody and they could sign on a loan and you could get equity in the deal. See what I'm saying? So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, challenges, downfalls, mistakes. I mean, how much time you got? 
We're good. We got all night. So whenever you want to tap out, what's yeah. something that somebody should look out for that you can prevent somebody else from making the same mistake? Yep. So a lot of, there's a lot of people that don't agree with this because everybody has different buy boxes. You got guys that buy for appreciation, cash flow, so on and so forth. I say stick to wholesale prices. You can't lose. So 60% on the uh, dollar, 60, 60% ARV. I don't budge much on that. Right. So there's so much cushion there. How can I lose? I try to mitigate. Yeah, there's still a chance. I mean, we could have another COVID or something go crazy. I mean, nobody expected that. But I want to mitigate my risk by buying deep as possible, because if something does happen, can I fire sell this? Can Mm. I get rid of it? Right. If this thing is 50 percent occupied, is it going to cover expenses and mortgage? Is it going to, you know, am I going to have, am I going to bleed? So I look at all these different things to mitigate my risk. So I'd say that'd be number one. So um, contractors was a big deal for me. Um, just having bad contractors, you got to understand how to vet your contractors, um, get some past work from them, uh, pay attention to giving them draws, work with contractors that can, you know, carry the load. Like, cause I don't want to be paying their payroll. I want to make sure that they can get some materials on the job site, do the job. It goes both ways. I mean, there's got to be some trust. Do you penalize them for going over deadlines? Uh, I didn't at first. I definitely do now. That's something I learned later into the game. If you say they need to be done on November 25th or the pay gets cut, you have a handshake written agreement. Yeah. And also uh, reward them for finishing early. Ooh, I never thought about that one. Yeah. So we'll give them a a bonus. So, hey, this is a four-month job. Our jobs last a long time. Like, our construction can go on from, you know, three months to six months. Um, And it consists of many trades, right? Electricians, road work, plumbers, um, rehab guys, pool guys. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we let everybody know. Because time is money. I look at it like this, you know. I would much rather give this guy on a $50,000 contract an additional $5,000 if he finishes early. That's a nice little check for him, right? That's a 10% bump. Or maybe we do a 5% bump, 2500 It's nobody, Not many people are offering that. So Correct. when they hear that, their ears stand up. But I also have them give me their timeline. I don't create it. Right. I want to hear what you got to say. If I don't like the timeline, then maybe it's not the right contractor or we need to discuss it. But typically, if they give me a timeline, then I say, hey, you're going to get penalized for this. And then they go, oh, hang on. Let me, let me, th- let me think about this for a second. If you lead with the value, though. That's right. Okay. So then we say, hey, well, listen, if you can finish this much earlier, like instead of four months, you think you can shave a month off, right? Or three weeks or two weeks. Because if we can finish that job early and we can fill, say, 10 spaces, I may have paid him 2500 to five grand, But if our average uh, spot is $500 a month, I made that back the first month just filling on, 10, yeah. on 10 units that are going to yeah. stay there and pay me every month. But every time, every month that goes by that I don't feel, I'm paying money and I'm not receiving money. Carrying cost. Exactly. So I try to make sure that, you know, we reward these guys if they finish early. I like the value add where if you're three weeks late, you know, three weeks early, you get an extra 5%. Three <clears throat> weeks late, you pay me 5%. Yeah, exactly. I like that. Yeah. I'm going to implement that one. Learning. Mm-hmm. All right. I got a little curveball for you guys. I want to ask you both the same question and let Justin go first and see how your answers differ. Okay. Because a lot of our viewers are wanting to get into the real estate game or they're just looking to start and maybe snag their first deal. If they walked into your office and asked you to mentor them, what pieces of advice would you give them starting out? Justin, go first. Man, the first thing I would say is my shortcut to success was I latched on to a good mentor. I followed him around with a notepad for three years. And even before that, I made sure not to waste his time, and I listened to six-plus months of Grant Cardone on how to buy multifamily. Before even knowing this mentor was even a person, I sharpened my sword. So whenever I went into his office, he knew that I was not going to waste his time. I have so many people DMing me every day, hey, can I shadow you? Can I mentor you? I'm going to need you to DM me at least 15, 20 times before (laughs) I take you seriously. I need to know that you have it. Like, I mean, you're in real estate— There's six plus month gratification where Mm -hmm. you do something, it's going to take six months for you to really get paid or get your money back minimum. Sometimes it's three years, sometimes it's five years. I need you to have long-term vision, persistence, consistency. I need you to be creative as well. If you can't figure it out, we have YouTube. We have Google. We have ChatGPT now. 
you do not need to come to me for every dumb question. If you think it's dumb, don't come to me. Stick the hard questions for me. Figure it out, and I'm going to be your bumper rails, like in bowling. I'm just going to make sure you don't go in the gutter. I'm going to make sure you don't make a mistake, but I need you to figure it out. That's some good stuff right there. Paul, what you got? I mean, it's hard to beat that because a mentor is, I mean, a thousand X on what you can do by yourself. Um, So... I would say and this this kind of probably bounces off this a little bit, but everybody's so concerned about how to get the next deal, how to build a company, how to hustle, how to make money, how to buy the car, the house, and you know all these things, whatever it is that means the most to you, right? <clears throat> but you got to work on yourself personally first, because how many people have you seen that just they buy the stupid stuff, they go broke, they hit what we're going into now is gonna you're gonna see who's real who's done a good job of, you know, putting their nest egg up, who's invested in good investment, who has cash flowing assets, those people are going to weather the storm because the winter is coming. Mm. And if you didn't gather your nuts, I promise you, you're about to get kicked in them. Okay. Mm. So listen, the thing is, is personal development, personal development. You got to work on you. You got to be the best version of you. You have to understand how to be a problem solver, period. You got to quit looking at problems as problems. You have to look at them as um, opportunities. Your whole mindset, first of all, has to change. So it kind of trickles on what he says, but I think that there's so many times you're not ready. When I opened my first business with Vaughn, I was not ready to manage people, right? I was young. I was 25. Um, You know, I was a poor manager. I was pretty much like, hey, get out of my way. I'm going to do this kind of thing. So I did, I could, I really never led anybody and I, I turned into a better leader, but you know, I tell people, Hey, listen, you got to work on yourself personally. If you want to do anything big, how you do anything is how you do everything. So take your personal development more serious than the job you work at, give them their time. But when you get off work, pour into yourself, right? Read your books, Get that mentor. Watch whatever you need to watch. Go to meetups. What is it? Who is it that you want to be? Oh, and be careful who you take your advice from. Take advice only from people you would trade places with. That's deep. You never you never hear that one. Yeah. Take advice from people you would only trade places with. If you wouldn't trade places with that guy, don't take his advice. Mm. Don't take advice from the broke stepbrother, the broke uncle, the you know, school teacher, aunt, you know, I mean, like none of these people can teach you how to make money. None of these people can teach you how to build systems and processes, grow companies and live a lifestyle that we were all put on this planet to live. I like that. Let's touch on this. You talked about the broke uncle, the broke aunt. A lot of young kids, we see it in the comments all the time. They're always asking, you know, how to get over the haters as they're, you know, embarking on their journey here, here and here. How did you deal with that? Did you have anybody, you know, being like, Yo, what are you doing? Be like buying real estate, getting in debt? Oh, man, my whole fa- All right, so <clears throat> my grandparents thought I was absolutely crazy. Um, my my uh, my parents, my dad passed one in 2012. He was he was an entrepreneur. He would he's rooting me on now. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, my mom, um, most of most of my family, I mean, they just don't understand business. They thought I was too risky. What are you taking this risk? What's going to happen? What if you go bankrupt? What if you do this? It's like, uh, well, what if I actually succeed? I mean, what if I actually, you know, kick this door down and grow this business so big that I'm able to do what I've done lately, like buy my grandparents a house, buy my aunt and uncle a house, take care of my family. Nobody has to worry about anything, right? Somebody's got to bear the weight on their shoulders to be able to do great things in this world. It won't come easy. And you have to stand out from the crowd. You can't listen to your aunt and uncle. That's the one thing I'll go back and say. If you have what it takes, you're not going to allow anybody to put barriers on you. You're going to be disliked by people. I was disliked by a ton of people. All the salespeople that worked around me did not like me. Because I took my profession very serious. I got there early. I sold deals and I didn't make excuses. I wasn't there to make friends. I was there to make money. And I had one thing in mind. How can I make more and how can I get more clients and how can I help them? My mentality changed a lot from that. That was a very sharp mentality, right? 
But when you're climbing from the bottom and you're trying to get to the top, it can be very lonely and it can be very, um, you can, you can create a barrier between you and other people because people don't understand you. They're like, why is this guy doing this? Why is he coming in early? Why is he staying late? What is he doing to sell this many cars, this many products, this much, you know, life insurance? How is he writing these retirement accounts like he is? Whatever the case may be. But what happens is, is you start realizing that as you keep going, your circle is totally different. Your people that you work with are different. That's why I recommend everybody that has that grit that they need to open their own company. And they need to build a culture that fits them. They don't need to try to fit in somebody else's culture. I love that. That hits me super hard because maybe about six months ago, I was that lonely guy. I didn't have anybody around me. Like I had all the friends, the girlfriend, everything. Life was great, but I couldn't have those conversations with people. Then I met this dude. <laughs> and it just flipped upside down. Like when you surround yourself with different people, like you're saying, you just your eyes open up. Not like your eyes weren't open, but it's like your eyes see other eyes that can see the same thing you see. Yep. It's pretty cool. That validates everything I've been going through for the past six months. Yeah, and, and you know, he's genuinely proud of you. Genuinely wants you to. So it's, it's, it's like a couple of ways to look at it is that you change your level, your circle. If you show me who your five people is, I can show you how much money you got in the bank. I can show you, I can probably write your goals down for you. If somebody tells me who they're hanging out with, mm. if I can see that, I can tell you where you're going and what you're going to do. Doesn't mean you're not going to change things and pivot and do better. But I can tell you right now, if I look at, you know, your five people that you're hanging out with. So you level that, those people up. But what what's even better is when you pull people down, when you pull people that are down up with you, Right. So you got this level of people that push you and, you know, you'll sit at a table and they'll call you out and they'll tell you, hey, Paul, you can't wear that many hats in your business. Hey, Paul, you know, they're looking at it from a standpoint. They're not your mom, your dad. They're business owners. They're they're entrepreneurs at the most elite level. And they're telling you things that you need to hear if you want to get on their level to stay in that group. You got to make moves. Because they're not going to be letting... A players hang out with A players, man. C players don't get in that circle. But, however, if we are true, genuine people that want to help others, then we need to pull somebody up with us that's willing to come and fight that fight. So, yeah, I have this group, but I'm also pulling others up with me because I was pulled up to that group. A good way is to do that. A good way to do that is to lead by example. I push so hard in life that it almost motivates people around me just to work harder because they know they're going to get lapped if they don't walk at least half the same speed as I do. Just the gravitational pull from how hard we're working has brought a lot of other people around us to up their content production, start posting more, get in the gym more. I 100% agree with what he says. Dude, I mean, I'm to the point now where if I got one bad apple around me, they got to go. Yeah, yeah, but at what point is the dead At what point do you cut the dead weight? Like, that could be your boy. Like, it's been your boy forever. At what you point three do you chances. cut the dead weight? I give you three chances. <laughs> three chances. I, I'm going to tell you to do something. Right, first, I'm going to ask you to do something. Then I'm going to tell you to do something. Then I'm going to make you do something. And by make, I mean you're out. I'm going to ask you, hey, here's what you're doing to negatively impact my life and where I'm going. I'm going to ask you to change that. The second time is going to be the warning. I'm telling you, you need to change this. You need to stop either drinking so much. You need to stop being so erratic. You need to stop surrounding yourself with people that are going to get me in trouble just from associating with you. I love you, but here's my warning to you. If you don't respect me the same way, you got to go. Because if this conversation was reversed, we wouldn't even get to level number two. You're going to ask me to do something. It's done. Anything that I do that negatively impacts you, it's not even a conversation if the roles were reversed. So I treat people with the same respect I want to be treated with. Lead by example. Three You got three chances with me, pretty much. I got you. I think this is uh, often misconstrued in, in video format, because a lot of times I'm watching videos, and the people are saying, if your friends aren't doing what you're doing, you shouldn't be friends with them. But I mean, personally, I would love to hear your takes on this. Say, all right, real estate guy, real estate guy. Say you have friends, you know, who's just a fry cook or he just, you know, works for corporate America. Like, it, it's okay to have friends who aren't on the same path as you. 100%. Now, when I say path, I don't need you to have the goal of owning 500 apartments, 1,000 apartments by the time you die. I need you to just be moving forward and killing it and walking your own path with me. I need you to just 
not be net negative in my life. I need you to be at least net neutral and moving forward. Okay. You might have a goal to, you know, say you're a fry cook. Let's say you want to own a restaurant one day and you're working real hard to get that. You're walking my path. I'm a real estate guy. Let me help you buy a restaurant. I'll lease it back to you. We'll do under financing 30 years from now. It's your restaurant. So as long as you're moving forward in life and you are giving more value to the world than you're taking, you're a producer and you're not a consumer, you're all thumbs up in my eyes. You know, I need you to be giving back to the group, the community. I need you to produce fruit when I plant seeds. I need you to water everything that I'm doing. I need you to nurture it and grow. That's good stuff. Yeah, pass I mean, it over to you. yeah so, so I, I think it changes over time. I think the more the, the more you live life by design, um, you're building your company, you're building your family. Um, things change for you. So is your circle eventually, right? There's guys that you may want to play softball with or shoot some basketball with or work out with. That's fine. I agree with him. I mean, these people need to be positive people because, I mean, if they're still talking about, you know, why they're not where they're supposed to be and it's constant, you know, that's not a conversation we want to have. But as long as we're being positive and having a conversation, that's fine. Those are friends that if they're just genuine people that are good people, good hearts. You know, they just have a different path than me. That's fine. I'm, I have friends like that. But when you organically grow like you will, uh, you will notice that your circle change undoubtedly without you even truly putting in a ton of effort because you're working on yourself so much that you automatically are their gravitational pull to your next level of people happens. So you find yourself spending more time with those people and less time with the guy you play baseball with or the guy you may go hit the gym with, you know, um, because man, guess what? He's going to the gym after he gets off work. You're going to the gym at 5 a.m. You're not, you're not seeing him as much anymore. So it just organically happens. It's not a, it's not a bad thing. It's not a negative thing. It's just, we're on two different paths. Um, but you definitely got to cut the negative weight. I mean, that's that's easy, you know. Hey, listen, we we don't see eye to eye anymore. We got to be done. Um, so, and and also hanging with super high level people, you'll realize that they're your allies, man. You know, and when you're when you're building something great, that never stops. So your allies grow, and that becomes your real friends, people that have a vision like you do, right? And it could be in different uh, asset classes. It can be, at, you know, different business owners. It can be whatever, man. I mean, at the end of the day, I think it just organically happens. And you kind of, you know, what you what you really want to happen expands just naturally. It's just funny how, you know, the law of attraction works. Mm. Like all this old school stuff that we've read is so real. It's hard to believe it at first. I know I kept reading these books and listening to Jim Rohn and Les Miles and Zig Ziglar, like old school folks, right? The philosophy guys. <clears throat> yeah. And I'm like, man, I hope what these guys are saying is true. Um, but I'd listen to all that stuff all the time when I was in the insurance business, because when you're door to door insurance, man, you got to have some motivation. And, um, you know, they always said it, law of attraction. You are who you spend your time with. You're the average of your top five friends. My business partner and I was talking about it uh, about a week ago because we hold each other accountable in everything we do, in business and sports. So he's a Ironman. He's done like three or four Ironman. So it's something I want to do. And, um, you know, so we started like sending each other's weight, what we're doing, what we're working on and like very granular on things like that. Right. And he was like, you know, it's funny, man, because like you and a few of us that are doing deals together, like we're the same height, same weight, you know, doing the same deal, same vision, same philosophy. We attract that. So it, the world works like that. And that's a long way of saying it. So. To summarize that, a rising tide lifts all ships, right? <laughs> yeah. I like that. He says that like 10 times every day. I, I've heard him you, say it twice you, now, and it makes, I mean, it, it's true. I just got to keep speaking it into existence. Yeah, man. So I love it. I'm going to take five minutes, and if you want to do the same, I'm going to ask you questions 
from a selfish standpoint, I want to ask you, you know, I want to be where you're at in you're eight years ahead of me right now, eight and a half, probably. How old are you? I'm 27. Yeah, and you're 30. I'm 10 years, bro. You're 10 years? 10. Okay. I want to get to where you're... Just turned you're, 37 last Sunday. I want to get to where you're at right now so I can have the exact same conversation to somebody else 10 years younger than me. Okay. If you could go back to yourself at 18 years old and offer yourself one bit of financial advice in one minute or less, that could change the course of your life. And it, it doesn't have to be personal, like, you know, buy Bitcoin or anything like that. Something, something that would change the cor- course of your life. So I... I had this sweet girl <clears throat> that was recommended to me to talk to. She's she's got two boys. Never met her in my life. And she was like, Hey, I need some I need some investment advice. I went through a divorce. I have two kids, two young boys. And I was like, you know what? I wanna I wanna chat with her. So I scheduled something like a week later. We got on the phone and we started talking about all this. And I kinda took her back. And after we had this conversation, she was texting me like, Oh my God, I mean, this is just revelation. And this is how simple it was. This was my answer. You have to work on yourself. I'm going to go back to that every single time. You know, you have to understand that you just can't get up and go after it each day. One is, is you got to educate yourself, not over educate. Don't stay on the sidelines, but you have to educate yourself. You have to build yourself to be prepared for these big things in your life. Right. So I'd say personal development is number one. You know, because if you talk to me back when I was 20 years old, I was negative. Um, I was drinking at bars, 21. I was drinking at bars. I was working construction. I was hanging out, talking crap about the boss. That was me. I'm not that same guy. I had the entrepreneur mindset, but I was hanging around the wrong folks. So you need to make sure you put yourself in the room with the people that you want to be like. Um So if I was 20 years old, I'd tell myself that, man. One, you got to get yourself right. Two, you know, don't buy any of the flashy stuff. Don't drink alcohol. Uh, Drink water. Don't drink alcohol. Drink water. Don't party. Don't worry about girls. You know, build your business. So get a mentor. Um, That's the shortcut to life, to business. And once you get yourself right, then you can become successful. How many people do you guys know that you would say, man, if that dude would get his shit together, he would kill it. Can y'all say that about I'm, a few I'm dealing people? dealing with two or three right now. And you, how, how great would they be if they were self-disciplined and they helped themselves? Like you could give them a million dollars today and they'd be broke next month. So what does all these investments matter if you don't have your head right and you don't make and you don't, you know, pour into yourself? So I told her, I said, look, you need to educate yourself for one. You need to um, take care of yourself. You need to understand where you want to go and reverse engineer it. What do you want? Because if you just start buying real estate, maybe it's too much for you. You don't like the business. It's it's not a good fit because it's not a good fit for everybody. You know, we make this look like it's all, you know, rainbows and butterflies. But, dude, it's war. It's tough. It's challenging. And without my team, I couldn't accomplish what I have. So I don't take all the credit. Um You know, so like I told her, you know, you got to work on yourself. You have to get yourself prepared for big things, you know, and get your first deal. And I always would tell anybody real estate would be my option to to go into. Um, It's the one thing that I've had uh, no ceiling on. I've had a ceiling on every everything else I've done. I've had a glass ceiling or sometimes a hardcore ceiling, right? There's only so many seats in a restaurant. You can only fill it up, right? Or you can, you know, so much life insurance or so many cars or so many this and that. In real estate, you can buy any type of asset from, you know, hotels to RV parks to apartment complexes to single families to short-term rentals to mobile home parks, um, you name it. I've got a bit of a deeper question. Uh, what gets you out of bed in the morning? What's your why? Mm. Oh man, I cannot wait to get out of bed in the morning. So my why is my family. That That's my biggest thing. I, <clears throat> I want to be there every moment for my son. I want to be there every moment for my daughter, for my wife. I don't want anybody telling me, or I don't want to have to say, hey, dude, I want a two week vacation. Like literally my wife and I just booked a trip out of the country today. Right. And we're taking the kids and the school teachers are going to have to deal with it. We're going to get doctor to write a slip. OK, we like to travel. We like to live life by design. Um, my family is everything for me, man. I want to make memories. I want my children to grow up and say, man, 
you know, me and dad and mom and sister really spent quality time. So that way they spend quality time with their kids when they have them. And that passes down to their children. Even if I can't pass the real estate down, I'm going to pass the mindset down, right? So my why is my family, man, it, 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 as cliche as it can sound. Um, and, and I don't really care to leave a legacy behind. My legacy is going to be how my family reacts to the way we live our lives on a daily basis so that they can, can continue to live theirs and the family that just the Larsons, right? So my children can carry on that. That's, that's the kind of legacy I want. I really don't care what somebody thinks about me 100 years from now. I want my children's children's children to have the mindset to understand that life by design by design is real. It's real. Mm. I figured that was coming. I could just I just gathered that from the conversation we had. You never even mentioned that, but I figured that was coming. Let's go down the list one more. Do you value health or wealth more? Because we haven't touched on health. 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 So health. do you do you mind going through what you do? Like just super quick, are you do a workout guy? You mentioned Iron Man's like yep. what goes on because yep. so I'm I'm not on that level. Um, but I do go to the gym six days a week. Uh, so my, my regimen is this, I wake up usually between five and five thirty. just depends, you know, m- what day it is, what I have going on. So I'll wake up, brush teeth, water, make a pot of coffee, take a B12 vitamin. Um, and then I do four things. I read my devotional, which is a one pager. I read, uh, Bible scriptures now, cause I got into a Bible study group. Um, so I did add that. And then I read, um, uh, 20 pages every morning of a book. I'm on Atomic Habits right now. Um, <clears throat> so I read 20 pages and then I journal. And it's very simple. It doesn't take but about five minutes. I put at the top one thing. What is the one thing I have to get? I want to get done today, right? No matter what I do, this is the one thing that's going to happen. Below that, I put a quote of the day because that kind of gives me some energy and, and something to kind of vibe off of. And then I put three personal things I want to accomplish. And man, I've, a lot of times it's like play soccer in the backyard with Parker, right? I'm family driven to the fullest, probably trying to make up for a lot of long hours I put in with, with when we had Avery, right? So um, and then the second, is, the, the last thing is um, three business uh, that I need to knock out, right? What are three things in business that I have to get done? Once that's done, um, eat breakfast with uh, the family, get everybody ready for school. They go to school and I go to the gym. And then I hit the gym. Uh, I normally run in between one to three miles before I work out. And then I work out two muscle groups. So I'll do like back and by today. And then I'll hit 15 minutes in the sauna. I, don't, I, I will cut my workout a few minutes short to hit the sauna. I love the sauna. And uh, then I go home, shower, and then I, I start worrying about work. I don't do anything with business before that. So by the time I get home uh, and shower, my partner and I hop on the phone every day, Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. CST. He is in the U.K. right now. So, uh, I mean, we've closed deals where he's been in China the U.K., I mean, Hong Kong. I mean, no matter what is going on, we talk every day because we treat our business like an institution, right? Mm. So um, that's kind of my workout regimen. And and I say health because like that gets me flowing every single day. And that regimen doesn't change. I do that every day. Yeah, that's good stuff. I I always like hearing highly successful people's take on health. It's normally always the same. Health is always comes number two right after family. Well, what man, wealth is easy. Health is important. Like once you make money, like once you figure out how to make money, you start wanting to take care of your health more. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, money is like the most important thing at first. What well, was for me, it was like, I want to provide for my family. I want to start my own company. I want to have a nest egg. I don't want to have to worry about where this money's coming from. Once that happens um, and you understand your value in the marketplace and, and you just crush it from that point and you put your team together and you have your ups and downs, but you have, you know, more wins than losses when you have the right team. So, you know, then you're, you start paying attention. Well, now I got to protect this. So you kind of give up a little bit of health grinding and then you realize, man, I got, I need to take care of myself more. And once you start taking care of yourself more, you realize how much that blends into life, marriage, your children, your wife looks at you working out, your children see you working out, your people you do business with, who you want to do business with, a slob or somebody that works out? 
I mean, it's just, that's all there is to it. It gives you more confidence. You feel better. You look better. Um, there's no down, there's no negative on health, on working out, period. If you could, to sum this up, if you could give your top three delegation tips that you've learned over the years, because I'm in a position in my life right now where I'm trying to free up time. I'm trying to buy time, human hours. I'm trying to, I'm trying to buy resources. Mm -hmm. What are three things that have just drastically improved your life? Number one is going to be focus on what you're great at. Like, what are you so badass at that you feel like you're the best, right? So when you focus on that, you need to start realizing how to delegate the rest. So I'll tell you something you can do. Somebody taught me. <clears throat> Takes a little bit of effort, but that's why only the top 1% are successful because they're willing to go the mile. Write down your daily schedule, Okay and say for two weeks and check yourself every 15 minutes and put a smiley face to what makes you happy put a dollar sign next to what's making you money put a uh, red x to what is not making you money put a sad face next to what you don't enjoy now you know what to delegate hmm. once you learn how to what you, and then you'll figure out what you're great at and what's making you money don't be doing 15 20 hour dollar job stuff Right. You want to focus on, I don't know, what is your what is your goal? Or do you want to focus on thousand dollar stuff, 10K stuff, 100K stuff, multimillion? You know, I'm like I put seven figure, um, you know, activities on my time. Right. Seven figures, man. So I look at, OK, what is my time worth? I want to make sure that I'm negotiating deals and I'm raising capital I'm building re investor relationships and I'm stabilizing my projects. If outside of that, I delegate everything everything Smart. so um the top three on delegation right so one is uh that would be number one um to, to do what you're great at number two i would say um number two i would say you know that would be reverse engineer figure out what your what your big goal is and what is your biggest bottleneck Right. So whatever your biggest bottleneck is, is what you need to delegate, because a lot of time that's where your procrastination comes in because you don't enjoy doing it. Right. Or you're not that good at it. And I'm speaking personally for myself. There's a lot of things I, I stink at, man. I'm terrible at it. And the things that I really shine at, I try to focus on. So figure out what you two would be. Figure out your biggest bottleneck and, and then uh, delegate that. Uh, number three would be. Um, you need to figure out, do you want in-house or do you want uh, VAs? Because VAs can do the most mundane work that can freaking take you hours a day. Mm -hmm. And if you can gain back four hours a day of your life at 30 days, right? That's 120 hours a month. How many hours is that a year, right? So we're talking thousand plus hours a year that you can gain back by just putting VAs on mundane work. So I think it would. I would go back to your schedule. I would say dollar sign to what makes money, red X to what doesn't, happy face to what you enjoy, and a sad face to what you don't. And that is going to help you break that down and delegate that to somebody. I like that. Yeah. I'm reevaluating my whole life right now when you're saying that. <laughs> I know, man. How simple is that? But it's it's real. The wheels right. are turning. That was my last question. You got one more. Uh, yeah, but it's gonna it's gonna take take us too back, too far back. Summarize it. Summarize yeah. it. I'll fire it off real quick. You ask one. Let me find. Ask one real quick. Let me find a way okay. to make this clip. I can do this one. At what point do you think that you're going to stop? And this isn't a generic like I'm going to retire at sixty. At what point? 1,000 units, 2,000 units, 3,000 units. At what point are you going to stop climbing the mountain but plant your flag at the top of it? That's a hard one because you got a long life ahead of you. Goodness. Because that's a question. I, I The reason why I ask that is I have traded happiness for work and money and wealth and the grind. Same. A big portion of my life, and I don't really regret it, but I don't want to be doing that until the day that I die because I'm either – far on this side of the spectrum or far on this side of the spectrum. It's hard for me to be a happy medium. I'm either getting nothing done or I am killing it. <laughs> and it's hard for me to find that balance. That's something yeah. I'm working on in life. At what point are you going to say, I need to transition from my warrior or magician phase to my king phase? 
Man, I'm doing that right now, to be honest. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, man, I got to credit so many people that helped me get to that point, though. Um, my wife is the main reason I'm this far, man, because um, I can remember how many scary moments we had. And, uh, I mean, just like those beach houses. I was like, babe, I mean, we just bought this 48-unit park. Now we're looking at this deal here. I mean, I can't even think. She's like, nope, this is a deal. You're good at what you do. Let's figure it out. And that thing paid me my biggest return ever that I wouldn't have done without her pushing me or my business partner that helped me understand to focus on what you're great at, Paul. You are phenomenal at certain things. Let's just make sure that's all you do. So when you couple all that stuff together, man, I work a lot less than I used to. I, it's sometimes hard for me to admit that because I don't, I, I'm like, man, am I going to look lazy? Am I going to look like, you know, oh, I bought this real estate and now I can just sit back? That's not my mentality. But my mentality is, I don't know if I'm going to be here next year. I don't know if I'm going to be here in five years. And I was there with you working, shoot, man, 18 hour days. I traded a ton of happiness for money. I will not do that anymore. I won't. Um, and that's a pretty fulfilling, you know, moment when you realize that money doesn't move me anymore. Hmm. So again, that goes back to doing what I, what, what I have a few things that I'm great at. I focus just on that and I don't feel like I work, man. My business partner handles his portion and we have a good team. Um, you know, my, I'm, I'm, I'm smooth right now. So, um, we're closing on a deal tomorrow. We're closing on another deal. It's inevitable that we will own thousands of units. And I just don't see how I would stop, you know, as long as, and, and, and again, I told you earlier, we don't buy anything that changes our lifestyle. We don't. So I feel like, and we're expanding in other markets and other areas, not just in real estate. We're looking at buying companies. So we're, we're changing some things up too, you know, cause we're well capitalized. We're looking at buying service-based businesses. We're looking at buying, um, HVAC companies, plumbing companies, roofing companies. I mean, these are bolt on businesses to what we do. Right. So instead of building these companies, cause bootstrapping a company is hard as shit. Mm -hmm. I've done it several times. Not easy. We're looking to buy baby boomer companies, people that are about to get out of business that they don't really know what to do with their business, that kids don't want it. Um, so we're diversifying. We're looking at buying companies. I mean, I was just on the phone with one of my good friends. He's an investor of mine, and he's in Costa Rica with his wife. And he's like, hey, dude, I got a deal over here. We're looking at developing. I mean, there's when you have that level of people that you hang out with and spend time with that are doing big things, you constantly get pulled into amazing opportunities. So, and I tell them, hey, look, man, I'm happy to do it if I add value because this is what I'm great at. I'm not going to try to do anything else to become a partner in a deal. I'm going to bring what I bring. And if I fit, I fit. So, you know, I mean, I I, I, I don't know, man. I, I mean, golly, I could be 70 years old doing this stuff. That's that, the reason why I asked that question was, you know, it's almost like you got to tell the majority of the population, man, 40 hours a week is a part time job. But for individuals, like I would say, like you and me, man, when you work 80, 90, 100 plus hour weeks for just time on end, you start redlining yourself yeah. and you seem like the kind of guy like me. I don't care if I'm redlined. I'm, I'm there to do the job. If it takes yep. six months, eight months, two years, yep. I'll put my health aside to get it done. That's right. Mental health, physical health, whatever it is. Um, I just don't want to be in that mindset when I'm 60 to 70, 80 years old. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, but how do you break that? If like like our friend Brandon would say, you got to buy you got a that lot of dog real in you. You got that you gotta, dog hey, in you. <laughs> if you got that dog in you, how do you stop the dog from being hungry? Yeah, yeah. So you know, it's easier. Um, and I love Brandon. Uh, you know, smart individual, hard worker. He's got got the dog in him. He's right? got that dog in him. <laughs> um, I will say this: when you acquire large real estate and you hold it. You make a lot more money on a consistent basis and you start not having to find that next deal unless you want it. Yeah. We don't need another deal. I mean, good Lord, man, after a couple hundred units. What can you really, you know. Now it's just stacking more on top of more. And that's where, you know, that's why we're looking at buying companies and we're looking at buying businesses and expanding, you know, into other areas and, you know, capitalizing on some things. So, you know, when you, when you start 
You know, it's like you put your head down, you grind, and you get to a certain point where you have enough real estate, the cash flow is so heavy, mm-hmm. you know? So, you know, you can pull the brakes off if you want. But, I mean, I, I just think, you know, we're made to live a purposeful life. I mean, we're we're entrepreneurs, man. I don't know if anybody can honestly say they just turn it off, right? You just got to understand the levels, I mean, you do because you're mentioning it right now. You got the grind stage where you don't know shit, but you're just pushing through and then you get a little bit smarter and then you start building a little bit of a team. And then you, you, you know, you're wearing all these hats and then all of a sudden you get an integrator and then now you're the visionary and then you have this and that. And then once you build the team, you just focus on dropping in on the big meetings, you know, That's and then your, your team. Base. Yeah, that exactly. So at the end of the day, you know, you'll know when you have that opportunity and and that's because you won't have to buy any more deals, you know? And, you know, at the end of the day, it's 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 fun and you have a good team like my partner. I mean, I just couldn't imagine us ever not doing what we do. Hmm. It's interesting. Yeah. That that satisfies my question. You got yours summed up? Yeah, mine's mine's a bit of a selfish question, but I mean you mentioned you and your wife, you're happy and all that, but I'm going through a situation right now with my partner where it's rough because I'm working around the clock so much. Was there yeah. ever a point? At the beginning where it was, you know, a bit of a rough ride, how did you weather that storm? So I've, I've told people for many years that the leg up on the competition that I have is my wife. So this is something I would tell my 20-year-old self, okay? You asked that question earlier. This is, this is like real deal here, okay? Pick your partner wisely, Because if they don't have the same vision as you, if they don't have that drive, it is very hard to get them on the same page. Because when you get kicked in the gut several times and then you come home, you got to be able to come home and have that conversation. So I give it to entrepreneurs that don't have the better half to come home and talk to because I always had that, you know. Um, now I'm out there and I'm hustling. I'm doing what I got to do at that age. Um, but when I found my, when I found Vaughn, she helped me become the man I am, the business person I am. Um, she helped me see things in myself that I didn't see. And that's a special thing. So when she came home and had challenges at the restaurant and employee problems, and stuff like that, I'm saying, Hey babe, we got this. And I would have her back. So we constantly had each other's back. And so for people that are having that challenge with their better half, don't give up on them. That's not the way to do it. You know, if you love them and you want, if you see yourself with them and you think they're, you know, somebody special enough to put in the effort to keep them because you want to take them on this beautiful ride, then we've got to have a hard conversation. And that conversation needs to be like, hey, this is the deal. This is the goal. And I would... I would then break down the whole business plan because sometimes what we tell somebody and what we show them is two different things. They hear us talk this big game. They hear us talk about we're going to do all these grand things, but some people need to see it. And we say, hey, what we're going to be doing, sweetie, is we're going to be buying all this real estate or building this company or this you know, marketing company or whatever it is, right? And then at that point, this is what we're going to be doing. This is the money we're going to be making. This is where we're going to live. This is the lifestyle. I want us to be able to do this, this, and this, travel, whatever the case may be, whatever means a lot. Donate a lot of money to church or organizations or charities that we love. Um, And the only way to get there is I got to have you on my team. I need you on my side. I need you rooting for me because it's tough out there. And if they can get on your team, then we can rock. But if they can't get on your team, then your journey is more important than staying with that person. Mm. That's a hard thing to say, man. Yeah, I mean, but and you got to find somebody that's going to rock with you. And there is somebody out there, and, and I'm sure it's her. So you know, if she's listening, you know, I'm just saying it, it's it's very much important that you guys are on the same page. I had a conversation with a good friend of mine, and him and his wife were having this conversation. You know. And I said, dude, you got to reverse engineer it the same way you sell yourself to on what your on what your dreams are. You have to portray that into them. So that's that's my thing. I, I've never had to deal with that. Thank yeah. God. Yeah. I mean, thank you for that answer. One thing I've noticed as of lately talking to people that a lot of uber successful people 
have been with their partner from from the jump. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty interesting to see like that statistic, which is odd, odd statistic in my eyes. I wish I would have had somebody that would have been down for me since I started. That was one of my biggest things. I've had people jump ship. I've jumped ship on some people. It, it, I would be a lot further in life if I had one down person for me. One down person. But I'll be the first one to say, if they aren't a good co-captain or they're altering the direction of my life, I'm going to throw them off the ship. Um, <laughs> I'm not even going to let them on the ship. I'd rather have a crew of 20. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do, I'm not gonna do <laughs> hey, that. But I, I know where you're going One co-captain this. is so much better <laughs> than you know 20 random shipmates. Yeah. You know? so, yeah. And, I, and I'll tell you this real quick. So, And I agree with you 100%. My business partner and I were talking about this. And I bring him up a lot, man, because that's like a marriage, too. Right. Mm. And there's a lot of businesses that crash because of partnerships. And people are scared of partnerships. You know, and that's how we do our deals is partnerships, man. And we talked the other day because we have four or five large deals going on at one time. And we had things just blow up in our face, left and right, right? Do you know how much better it is to be able to get on the phone and navigate through that together yeah. than having to go sit down in your room, in your office, out there and look into the water and go, shit. Now I got to gather my thoughts and figure out. And now I got to get. So when you have the business partners, just like having your wife or girlfriend at home, you know, if they're if they have the same vision, they understand and they love you, dude, then, you know, they got to they got to have your back. And you got to when you, you it's it's easy to lose together, but losing by yourself sucks. The lone wolf thing can suck. So. Not only is your team important, your business is important, but your your partner. God, I, I think that might be number one. Your your partner in life. I can agree with that. Yeah, that's good stuff. You don't hear many people talk about this side of things, so it's it's a good. You're angle absolutely to look right. At. You're right. Yeah. Was well, there anything else you want to touch on, or Justin, you want to touch on anything? I mean, I could go for another two hours, but I'm gonna stop. We're gonna save <laughs> yeah. that for the second time we get him on if he would come, and we're gonna cut that short. How do we find you? Um, so go, uh, Facebook, Paul Larson, uh, Spanish Fort, Alabama, uh, Instagram is underscore Paul underscore Larson and also, uh, LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. So those, those are three platforms. All right. Awesome. Link below. We're going to make him get a link tree. All <laughs> yeah, my links. We got to hook you up with a link. We're going to hook you up with a link tree. They click one button. They'll get all your socials. Yeah. But uh, yeah, all the links should be down below, guys. And for the next episode, if we do get Paul back on, go ahead and drop some questions below this episode so we have some you know, shots to fire at him next time. But uh, yeah, guys, make sure you subscribe if you haven't. And without any further ado, we're going we're gonna to round this thing out. Thanks, guys.